So this is me, uh, Paul Ritchie. Um, uh, the little letters at the top. Um, I have. I'll do. I'll explain what these are because this is part of me being a member of this organisation. I'm a chartered biologist, so I'm a member of the Royal Society of Biology, uh, which is a professional body for biologists. It includes myself, a zoologist, and then botanists and various other biologists. And I'm an accredited practitioner for the Institute of Outdoor Learning, um, which is an organisation that covers. Um, Sophie's colleagues as well in outdoor learning. So it's a profession that, that body that guides us and gives us um, information about how we should operate good practice and sort of things we do. So it's a great organisation. So if there's anyone sitting here listening to this and you're involved in outdoor work, then and you're not a member, consider joining because it's it's a very useful organisation. Um, I always get asked a bit about myself. So this is the funnest, quickest way that I found of doing it uh, without going on too much. And this is me in the moments in time, a nutshell a summary of my, my life, if you like. Um, the four things in the middle are things that are important to me. Uh, my family. I'm a family man. I'm married. I have two sons, Callum and Munro. Um, Callum's graduated now and is an illustrator and designer. Munro studying virtually from home upstairs at the Institute at Imperial College London. He's studying geophysics. Um, I love art. Uh, Sophie and I were talking earlier about uh, Grace and Perry show and art. I'm passionate about art, illustration and sculpture. Um, and from a biological point of view and a gardening point of view, I love trees and bees. They're my passion. I studied bees and ants at university when I was a student. So when I started, I've been working, I worked it out this other day, I've been working since I was 14, I think, 15. I started as a paper boy. Um, and then during my school years, uh, I was a farm labourer. I worked on a mixed arable and uh, livestock farm, which was interesting. And that really fired my passion up um, for um, working outdoors. Um, when I was a student, I was a steam engine driver. My brother and I worked on a a small steam railway um, and were firemen and drivers and steam railways. That was a slight deviation from my, my route into conservation. Uh, as I said, I was a zoology student. I was lucky to go to the University of no uh, Nottingham, uh, a really good time when applied zoology was taking off. Um, and I did a lot of uh, coursework on um, ecology and conservation, um, insects, did a lot of work on insects, bees, ants, um, and did some projects on hermit crabs. Uh, and then I decided I don't want to work in a laboratory. Um, at the time, I was being encouraged to work in a laboratory. Uh, so I took a different route. I became a police officer um, in London um, and ultimately became a community beat officer, which is where my involvement with communities really took off um, in Haringey. And then after 13 years, I moved on and became a countryside ranger. And I worked for the City of London Corporation um, and worked at Ashton Common. Uh, in Surrey near Leatherhead, a National Nature Reserve now, um, and worked. And I started with one volunteer back in 1993. And when I eventually retired and left, um, there were 50 volunteers. So uh, a successful community woodland project. I then moved to Surrey Wildlife Trust where I was a community officer, did community engagement um, and adult education. And then in 2018, I left and became self-employed. Um, and then this year set up this community interest company uh, doing outdoor training, uh, which is why now I'm sat before you. So I run courses for Surrey Wildlife Trust, and we've, Sophie mentioned, we've got a wildlife gardening course come up and a pond improvement course coming up too uh, in the next month or so. Um, but I also do work for other organisations, private companies and individual clients. So, so top 10 tips for wildlife gardening. A little taster for you. Hopefully you may have done some of these things already, which is great, um, but maybe I can prompt you uh, with some ideas. Um, and this course, although, uh, as I say, I'm a CIC, a community interest company, it's being delivered in partnership with Surrey Wildlife Trust, um, who are the sort of countywide um, conservation organisation. And for those who are not familiar, the Wildlife Trusts, each county has its own trust, um, but they work together as part of a collective and partnership scheme. Ultimately, why are we trying to achieve? We are trying to achieve this. This is a baby wood mouse um, filmed on the path in our garden. Um, we were sitting having coffee one morning. 
um, and I spotted this movement um, and I lay down on the ground with my new camera lens and managed to capture this. And this is for me what it's all about as a zoologist is animals, getting wild animals into my garden. Um, and the route to do that is providing the right plants and the right habitat conditions. So that's, as you'll imagine, will be the focus of my top 10 here tips. So why, why should you garden for wildlife? Why is the Wildlife Trust asking you to garden for wildlife? Why are the RSPB, uh, the National Trust, the RHS, uh, people like me, why are we banging on uh, people saying, you know, you can, you can garden with wildlife, you can garden for wildlife, you can encourage them? Well, I'm sad to say um, that recent national studies and county studies uh, have uncovered this really quite depressing picture in a way. Um, you know, this, this was a... Uh, study of nature's condition and 12% of species have gone extinct in the study time. 21% um, under threat, only 15% stable, only 3% increasing, and then 50% are just sort of considered not in trouble. Um, that's, that's bad news, really. Um, and personally, I, I feel a passion to do something about it, but organisations have looked at various ways of doing th things about it and uh, one of the most uh, advantageous ways or one of the most effective ways potentially is through people's gardens. I don't know whether you realise this, but your garden is part of a network of gardens that constitutes one of the biggest areas of potential nature reserve in the whole of the UK. So gardening is important. People enjoy gardening for a whole variety of reasons, but they're little habitats for wildlife if we, if we carry out what we do in the right way. And that's what I'll be talking about. So what are we looking at conserving? Well, dandelion, common dandelion, it's not, a, it's not a rare species. It would be considered probably not under trouble, um, under the 49%. It's a really important uh, nectar source for um, bees when they first emerge, particularly queen bumblebees and some of the solitary bees. Yet people mow their lawns right through the flowering period. Councils mow their verges right through the flowering period. And so whilst the plant is not rare, seeing dandelion flowers <laughs> is quite unusual and therefore part of this program is to encourage people to consider not mowing things in May to allow these common plants but important plants to survive and of course that's ultimately what we want we want to see bumblebees we want to see solitary bees um, flourishing and feeding on plants house sparrow considered was considered very common species um, everywhere. Um, and for me, I don't, I don't consider it rare because we have the right habitat here. And we have five nesting families in our garden along the hedgerow and in boxes around the garden. So for me, house sparrows aren't rare, but they are on the decline. And they're on the decline because of lack of nat nesting habitat, because people are grubbing out hedges out of their gardens and replacing them with fancy fences and walls. And therefore they don't have anywhere to nest. Um, frogs, toads, newts, um, massive loss of ponds across um, most counties now um, and amphibians need ponds to breed in, to lay their spawn in and for their tadpoles to as larvae to develop before the adults um, develop later on and um, one of the best places for safe ponds, ponds that can be controlled, not have chemicals in them, not uh, be subject to other development uh, are people's gardens. Um, and one of the things I'll be repeating through this session is, is water. If you can provide water for wildlife, whether it's a large pond, a bucket pond, bird bath, whatever, it's one of the most important things you can do um, for wildlife. Uh, and you can do it at low cost as I'll show. So where do gardens fit into this national scheme? Because I, I, I mean, I've been in conservation industry a long time. I started as a student volunteering in Nottinghamshire on canals. Um, and I moved on to Chalk Downland um, and various habitats as I went through my volunteer and my professional career. Um, and organisations did their own thing. Surrey Wildlife Trust did its thing. National Trust did its thing. RSPB did its thing. And finally, <laughs> after 30 years, organisations are starting to talk to each other and they're starting to, to take a common approach. And it's all about connectivity. It's all about sites being linked, sites being joined up, um, organisations and people working together. So here's a little diagram to show that. So if you imagine the green blobs are sites, they might be a nature reserve, they might be a green space, an open space, a bit of private land in, in a decent size that can support wildlife is in good condition, hence the greens, traffic light system. 
Then you've got some amber ones that are slightly smaller, um, still supporting wildlife, but not necessarily as healthy as the green ones. And then the red ones, the little ones at threat. So, so conservation thinking now in the UK says, let, let's try and join those up. Let's, let's link those. So let's get some land. Let's get the people who own land around those sites to manage the land in a way that's more um, conducive to supporting wildlife. And let, let's give them a little bit of a buffer Let's create these little buffer areas around them so that they, they're less at threat. You know, let's get communities engaged so that they resist un inappropriate development and so that we maintain this um, uh, capacity for making space for nature and wildlife. Um, and then ultimately, um, when you look at schemes like the Biodiversity Opportunity Area Scheme that the Wildlife Trust is leading on in Surrey and other organisations involved in bee lines with bug life, um, let's join them up. Let's make links. Let's 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 try and encourage the farmers to be a little bit more sensitive about the land around it. Let's encourage the private landowners and gardeners to be, be a bit more supportive, and and that way we can join them up, and the wildlife can start moving around, and uh, and it gives greater capacity then to these these little islands, if you like. And so that's the thinking. That's how it works. So where where does your garden fit in that? Well, I've used myself as an example. Um, so these little squares are gardens, um, and they sit in the in that system. Um, I live near Box Hill um, and I live near the River Mole Valley, um, both which have areas of interest in and areas under threat. Um, and my garden sits in between. So you can see a little analogy that if I manage my garden as a little haven for wildlife, that I'm providing a stepping stone, if you like, between the green blobs and the yellow blobs. And your garden can do the same. And that really is a fundamental aspect of um, the Wildlife Trust approach to uh, wildlife gardening and other organisations. This is what it's all about. And you have an important role to play in, in that uh, as, as gardeners. And whether your garden is a big garden, a small garden, a courtyard garden, a window box um, is irrelevant. It all uh, joins up. You know, window boxes are like little cafes for insects. You have flowering plants on them. They can stop off on the way through, grab some nectar, keep them flying until they move on to the next place. So everything has a has a role to play. And if you really get into wildlife gardening, you can make your garden look like this. You can, you can you know, look, compost heaps, water butts, wild areas, bug hotels, ponds, flowering shrubs and trees, uh, little mini meadows, all these things are all little features um, that you can put in your, your garden to make space uh, for nature. And I would say, you know, I've got a fairly wild garden and I always have a caveat when people come here for courses or they visit when I do open gardens is that, that my garden's unusual in the fact we've got a medium sized garden, but uh, we started with a complete jungle and we've sort of reclaimed bits. So it started wild and we've sort of tamed it a bit in a way, but not everyone wants a completely wild garden um, and you don't have to. You can put in these features um, and you can still support wildlife. So it's about thinking about the different aspects of it, which we'll come to in a minute. So gardens are important as well um, for mental well-being, particularly it's, it's particularly relevant at the moment with lockdown. And Sophie and I, again, were talking about lockdown before you we, you joined us and about the value of being outdoors. And, you know, I'm a practitioner of the Institute for Outdoor Learning. We are firm advocates of people being outdoors. I've worked outdoors all my life. I know how important it is to get outdoors, to be in touch with green things, to be in touch with nature, to be in touch with animals and plants. Um, and gardening is a brilliant way of doing it. And this is a project um, in Redhill at uh, a set of allotments, um, New Pond Farm allotments near Earlswood Lakes. And in the background, you can make out some little tents and stuff. And this is part of a community project which provides uh, uh, social inclusion for people who feel isolated, who perhaps live alone, um, you know, divorcees who have separated and found themselves cut off from family connections, people who have been ill, people suffering from depression or mental illness, people with learning needs. So it's a fantastic project and it's in partnership with the RHS, the Rygate Council um, and Surrey Care Trust. And it, and it provides uh, an opportunity um, for people to engage and to learn skills. So gardening is a really good activity for that. Gardens are also outdoor classrooms. I was taught, um, my early years was taught about wildlife um, by my grandfather, who was a market gardener. He, he grew vegetables and fruit. And my grandmother, who 
were, took me out on the Dorset Heath and showed me smooth snakes and green lizards and bumblebees and tiger beetles. Um, and I learned and I took my children out into our garden and taught them. And obviously people like the Wildlife Trust have forest schools and various things. So they're brilliant places to learn. And they're great places that I use for teaching adults as well. So great places and good places to rest. So there's me having a little rest in the garden uh with my dog um after a hard day's work possibly <laughs> yeah beware the gleam off the forehead there in the sunlight so what's possible so what you know you might be sitting there thinking this is all very well but what how can how can i what do i what do i do how do i know what to do so the starting point for anything and i i've been managing green spaces and nature reserves and things all my life and i now manage some smaller one it's our garden but the starting point is always assess what you've got have a look what you've got in your garden what is there what have i already got um and the wildlife trusts you could get you can get a, a prompt sheet from this uh victoria um pinder who, who works for the wildlife trust is coordinates some wildlife garden stuff and they've got like sheets that you can use to assess your garden um, and decide whether it's good for wildlife but fundamentally we're looking at these four things does my garden provide food well, and, and as importantly, does my garden provide water? Is, is the food and water accessible to wildlife? Can they get to it safely? Can they use it? Does my garden provide shelter? Do I have shelter areas where things can hide from predators, can hide from me occasionally, um, can hide from bad weather, from frost, extreme cold, extreme sun and heat? Uh, and is my garden safe? And when I talk about safety in gardens, I'm talking about the biggest threat to wildlife on this planet, and that's us. So is my garden safe from me? Is it safe from what I do? Do I carry out my gardening in a way that doesn't harm wildlife and supports wildlife? And we'll come back to those things in a bit. But it's, it, it is really as simple as that. So food features, um, you know, here's a garden, a little shed, some cottage garden type styly with various flowering plants. Um, do I do I provide feeders for birds? And we do here. We have fat feeders and we have nut feeders um, here. But do, do do we provide feeders for animals? Do we provide nectar sources for insects? Insects. I'm obviously passionate about insects. I'm a zoologist. I focused on insects. But insects are core. They they pollinate. They're pollinators. All of them. I mean, we tend to focus on butterflies and bees. But beetles were the first pollinators on the planet. Um, and they are still major pollinators. So insects pollinate, they allow plants to sexually reproduce, they allow our crops to, you know, uh, develop, it allows to grow runner beans and peas and all the things we want. Um, but they're also a food source um, for other animals. Other animals eat them, other insects, birds, mammals. And for me, as, a, as a, an entomologist, um, they're just beautiful in their own right. And... Um, and do we provide things like berries? Have you got shrubs with berries on um, that will feed things in the autumn and winter, uh, birds and small mammals? Um, so I always advocate to people, if people ask me, what trees can I plant in my garden? I say, keep them small if you're in a, an urban garden and focus on flowering and berry producing ones, things like cherry and uh, rowan and uh, crabapple and those sorts of things, blackberry, uh, blackthorn, possibly hawthorn, things that will give food for animals water features as i said at the beginning water features really really important um that we provide water for uh wildlife um, of all in all forms insects and mammals and birds um, it's the best thing you can do most gardens that i surveyed when i was in the wildlife trust and subsequently as a consultant the thing that they're missing is good water sources generally um so really important thing to think about um, and we're thinking about amphibians, obviously, frogs, toads, newts. This is a great crested newt. It's rare and protected species. We have smooth newts in our garden. Um, we have toad, common toad and common frog. Um, so amphibians need water um, to lay eggs in and for the larvae to grow. In. But just don't forget that it isn't just about when they're breeding. So the amphibians will come out of the pond for most of the year and they'll need cover around the pond. The pond in the big picture there looks lovely. It's got lovely water, but it's actually got really mown lawn all the way around the outside. Look at it. So there's nowhere for the insects and, and the um, amphibians to hide. So you need to provide them with things like log piles and, and shaded and protected areas where they can go and hide. 
newts will move two or three kilometers away from a pond uh, out of season. So just bear in mind, they need to be allowed to move around and, and live elsewhere. Toads, I love toads. Um, we have slow worm and toad in the garden. And as a consequence, we have very few slugs. Um, they just eat them all. So we don't need to use slug pellets. Uh, and then you go, ponds attract things that you wouldn't get otherwise, like dragonflies. Um, and so we have in our garden, we have about nine, 10 species of dragonfly, damselfly that visit um, the area. And they're lovely to watch. They lay their eggs on the plants in there and they feed over the ponds and eat midges and things. So shelter features. Well, bird boxes, the classic one, isn't it? We've all seen and heard bird boxes. So uh, the one thing I'd say about bird boxes, while well, I remember just um, don't map, don't put them up facing south and west. If you put them up facing south and west, they overheat. They get hot in the in the high to the day and at the end of the day. So you should face your bird your your bird box facing north or um, east, so that they don't mind the morning sun, um, but not heat of the day. It's the opposite for insect boxes. If you put insect boxes up, you have them facing south or west, so they get sun. So when the insects emerge from their bee homes or whatever the insects are, they can warm up in the sun and fly off. So just bear that in mind. Um, bat homes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a bit muted thing about bat homes, really. Big bat colonies and and, high, and places for bats are brilliant. The boxes that you can put up, they, they will use them um, if they're caught out in the cold overnight, possibly, but they're really a bit too small for bats to um, survive. Ideally, what you want to be doing is is either providing access to your loft or if you've got bats in your loft not excluding them because that's where they're going to stay safe and warm um, there are ways if you're concerned if you have bats in your loft and you're concerned about it, there are ways that you can legally and safely partition off the area where they are from the rest of the loft so you don't have to worry about disturbing them and they can carry on doing their thing um, hedgehogs um, we've just put a hedgehog box in the garden so hedgehog boxes um, useful there are Check the designs. Don't buy these ones that you can see online with made that are all woven with sticks because the hedgehogs get stuck in them. You're much better off with a simple um, hardwood ply box like this um, and just shove it full of grass and moss and stuff and they'll use it. But there are good guidelines online um, about making these. And bee and insect homes. And this is a leaf cutter bee that's cut a bit out of uh, our rose bush, um, rolls it up puts it in the hole, stuffs it full of pollen, then lays its egg in it and then seals it up. So I love fascinating insects. I love them. Safety features. Well, composting is a good one. You know, don't burn stuff. Um, dead hedging. I haven't got a picture of dead hedging in this, I don't think, but uh, we don't burn any of our hedge cuttings. Um, they all get stacked into dead hedges along the boundaries and we use them instead of buying fencing. So uh, we don't burn anything, but all your green stuff. Um, compost it. Slug pellets really uh, people will companies will tell you slug pellets are all right they don't harm anything they're not they're uh they're toxic they have uh chemicals in them which kill the slugs obviously but they also kill other things and they will kill and poison the things that eat the slugs so you'll poison the toads you'll poison slow worms and you'll poison hedgehogs so slug pellets no if you are able like we've been able to establish now a healthy population of slow worm uh, the last count under a mat we found 14 uh, of all ages and we know we have toads and we know we have visiting hedgehogs we don't have a slug problem basically they get eaten by the other animals chemicals i'm a i'm an organic gardener my wife is as well we have been as long as i can remember i hate use of chemicals there is no such thing as specific chemicals companies will tell you they are but they they kill everything um so uh, i avoid using chemicals and if you're going to be a really garden with wildlife, then chemicals are off the list. They should go. Um, don't believe the hype of these companies. Um, and I dread to think that people are still using peat based compost. Um, apart from the RHS that has to use them for certain rare orchids and carnivorous plants, and they're trying to find alternatives. There is absolutely no need to use peat based compost these days. Um, and we haven't done for years. So that's all about. Um, making it safe for wildlife. And I go further, I don't use power tools. So I use hand tools to do everything and I scythe my garden um, so that I don't chop things up, but 
that's uh, I, you know that's me as a biologist i'm prepared to take that so some top 10 tips let's start with part one so this is easy ways five easy ways on how you can garden with wildlife so safety yeah how can I make my garden safe i've touched on a lot of this organic gardener don't use chemicals. Um, people get strung out about wasps. Uh, wasps are really good predators. They eat the things that eat your vegetables. Um, uh, and as long as the uh, the nest is not too close to where you are, um, and you can deter nests by, you, if you've got an old nest and you hang it up, or wasps won't build nests, new nests near old nests. They assume it's another colony. You can use those sort of um, paper-based, like round globe um, lamps. I've, we've got one under our... Um, uh, uh, pop-up shelter which keeps them away but they will eat all your predators they the only time that they're a trouble um is in the uh, at the end of the season in the autumn late summer autumn when the colony's starting to die back and the queens have departed and the workers are still around and they they're just out hunting for food and you can distract them by putting jars of um, sugary water and stuff away from where you're you are um, and they'll go to those because they're just looking for food and eventually they die anyway um hornets um, we have a hornet nest in a in a bird box attached to my workshop. Um, they they're not as aggressive as as wasps. They're quite the opposite. They tend to avoid people. And the beautiful thing about hornets is is that they actually kill wasps. So at the moment the hornets moved in, the wasp nest was vacated because the hornets killed them all. Um, so that is late life, I'm afraid. That's uh, the food chain. Um, avoid cutting your hedges during the bird nesting season. So we don't cut at all between the beginning of March. Uh, and the end of August and then we just double check in September to, just to make sure that um, there's no late broods going on um, so we avoid that cutting season altogether um, and then as I say we cut in sections as we go and stack the material to our dead hedges. Keep ivy if you can, allow it to flower in the winter. Ivy does not kill trees um, despite the mythoid that's been knocking around for years, they don't kill trees um, they provide shelter and cover and they flower really late and they're a really, really good nectar source for insects at the end of the season. Our ivy bush um, last season was just covered in solitary bees, wasps, hornets, um, various late uh, butterflies. So really good um, nectar source and encourage the predators, encourage your ground beetles, encourage your, your wasps and your hornets because they'll eat the things that are eating your veg. And if you really want to go the full whack, uh, stop digging. <laughs> uh, digging and ploughing damages uh, root structure, it damages uh, mycorrhiza of fungal structure and soils, and it damages the things like earthworms that are in the soil. So you actually, by ploughing and digging consistently, you're actually, um, dam you're actually harming your soil structure and you end up having to then add nutrients to it to grow things. Whereas if we stop digging so much and ploughing, um, the system would go into balance. So just something to think about. And there's loads of information about that online if you want to look that up. Um, no mow, so we don't mow. Um, I've done two cuts this year, one in March, one in April, and we've now stopped mowing. Um, uh, and we'll allow the flowers, the little flowers like dandelions and, and daisy to flower and to provide nectar sources. But think about uh, when you're mowing about creating structure, think about the structure in your shrub layers because the more structure vertical structure and horizontal structure you have in your garden the more wildlife you have so this is a view off our extension to the end of our garden and over the back is you can't see it but there's the river mole sitting in the bottom of the valley um, and to the left is uh, some pasture land of the neighboring estate um, where you have cattle ranging through so it's quite a nice spot from attracting other wildlife in but this is these are the features that we put in place. So we have a mature tree at the back of the garden. So that's a, a um, field maple. So it's got some ivy on it. As you can see that dark stuff in the top there is ivy growing up. It's a large field maple. It's got about five stems um, and it attracts things like nuthatch, tree creeper and woodpecker. If you've got a smaller garden, I would say to put fruit trees. Fruit trees are the thing. They flower, they produce berries, as you say, for what, as I said, for wildlife. And you can eat the fruit yourself. <laughs> Um, so we have a cherry there. We also have a in the foreground on the right by the pond is an apple tree. So it's an eating apple tree. We're lucky we've got a hedgerow. Um, it's an old field boundary. It's the parish boundary, actually. And it's an old field hedge. It's got about 
12, 13, 14 different species in it. So it's quite a mixed one, but you can plant it and shrubberies function in the same way that hedgerows do. If you put your shrubs together, you effectively, you're creating a hedge. Um, they provide cover and, and bird nesting sites. Long grass areas, so at the bottom of the hedge, um, we've got uh, hedgerow plants growing and long grass coming down to short grass. Our actual, this is a picture from a couple of years ago. Our garden now actually, is less formal than this again. Um, and that pond is the year that we made the pond. So the pond has matured since then. Um, short grass areas, short grass areas are important. Bare ground is actually important. So short grass allows certain flowers to propagate and insects and bare ground areas provide sites for bees and things and ants to go in. And then flowering shrubs are important. Um, they don't have to be native necessarily. That's a New Mexican orange. Um, we have viburnum as well in the garden that flowers at different times. They all provide nectar sources uh, for insects throughout the year. Gravel gardens. My wife and I, Claire, we're keen advocates of cultivating with chaos. Um, and I use that term because it's actually a book entitled that called Cultivating Chaos, written by some German gardeners. Um, and it's and this we picked up this idea from Dungeness. So uh, if anyone's had the good fortune to have visited Dungeness, then you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you should go. Um, it's all gravel and sand area, but full of self-propagating, self-seeding plants. And it's a blaze of interesting colour. And this is our gravel garden. So we've got a variety of plants. We've got some drought tolerant plants. They're the grey ones, the lavender, um, some spirea, some Mexican orange. And then we've got a lot of self-seeding plants, uh, various poppies, um, knapweed um, and pot plants as well. A lot of herbs. So a drought tolerant, and in the background, you can see our vegetable area. So Cultivated Chaos by Reef, Cress and Becker, uh, 2013, brilliant book. If you're really into your gardening and, 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 and you can prepare, you're prepared to step back and let go and allow plants to do their thing, um, definitely a read if you haven't seen it. Um, and we found it, it's an absolute delight. And what's actually happened is we found our gravel area has become a seeding area that with perennials when they become established, we actually dig them up and move them into other parts of the garden and they're easy to get out of the gravel. So um, it's been a real plus creating this area for us. Reduce, re repair, recycle. Uh, I don't know whether I'm afraid. Uh, we've got a bit of a reputation in our estate. We take anything and materials and build stuff with everything. Um, so pallets, uh, old water, but we've got old water barrels that we, I cut in half and have turned into planters. Plastic, uh, I never buy new plastic stuff, but I recycle and reuse a lot of plastic stuff because it's better than going to landfill. So we've got bucket ponds and things for collecting water using old um, barrels. So we try and reduce what we buy and use, reuse anything we can, repair stuff and recycle. Um, sustainability. Um, free cycle shop we use, free cycle and reuse shops. There's a reuse shop at our local tip in Red Hill. Um, that we use free cycle we use locally and local neighbourhood. I don't know about you guys, but Locked, one of the plus things that's come out of the pandemic and lockdown, we, we've always speak to people we see, but actually my son, my eldest son, bless him, he set up a WhatsApp group, the, the, the estate, um, that started as a COVID one, really, about providing support to people if they needed it, but has blossomed into so much more, not least sharing and recycling of stuff. So a real positive outcome from a bad situation. Um, that's another view of the uh, gravel garden and we use a lot of drought tolerant plants and particularly herbs we we cook a lot um, with um, herbs um because we like why buy them when you can grow them the flowers attract a lot of insects um, and they are drought tolerant plants they, a lot of them come from the mediterranean so as climate change kicks in um they're useful plants to have and they're really good for insects and they smell really nice and you can have nice food. So they're the sort of things we've got in there, lavender, Mexican orange, spirea, some potent telehebes, um, oxide daisy, netweeds, poppies, um, self heal, called marigold. Green alkanet, a lot of people see that as a weed, but we, we actually have got it all over the place. It's growing on the side of the house. You can just make out on the left there. Um, really good for um, insects. And our latest thing is alliums. Alliums, they just go everywhere. And a lot of them self seed, we were surprised. So. So that's uh, how you can garden more sensitively. Um, the next second part of the top tips, really part two, is five easy things to make your garden, making your gardens, the things you can build, construct if you like making things uh, to support wildlife. So water, I said about water. Um, 
and I always get asked the question this because obviously we've got a quite big it's a medium-sized garden by Surrey Wildlife Trust classification but it's a quite a big garden and not everyone has a big garden but any water is good uh, uh, and I put this slide in deliberately um, we've created one using an old sand pit from a neighbour um, but bucket ponds are just as good um, for wildlife so you can use an old waterproof pot any bucket any bag anything really that will hold water uh, just make sure that it's sort of reachable from the ground this one is a bit this is a stock photograph um, there's a lot of rocks around it it's a bit in uh, the one we've created um, that's settling in now um, I've made it at ground level and it's got a little ramp in it so things can get out if they fall in um, but use sand and gravel if you're using sand just a word of caution use sharp sand or silver sand not builder sand um, builder sand uh, will change the pH of the water and it gets murky so you want an inert material so uh, ballast with sharp sand is okay and silver sand like you use in sand pits is okay um, and if you're going to use soil you can get aquatic compost which is low nutrients if you put in normal soil it's often too much nutrient in it and you'll get a lot of algae in your pond um, so add your water and plants pile some stones around the edges so things can climb in and out and put in other plants and things around to provide shelter so this one is actually sat in the rockery. Our one is sat in the uh, under a tree next to the hedge, so there's a bit more cover. And there's we've put a log pile by. But small ponds are good. Food, yeah, bird feeding tables, um, bird boxes, uh, hangers, like we showed in the earlier slide. Um, it says in there, once you start feeding them, don't stop. That's really in the winter. Um, we feed right through the winter. The trouble is if you start putting out stuff, then the birds will get used to it. They'll come to it. And then if it's not there, they have to go somewhere else and find it. And they're expending energy to go and find it. So it's a bit of a commitment. This. So if you start feeding in, in autumn, then you need to carry on uh, through the winter. We stop about now. We basically, when our reserves run out, we've still got some peanuts out. The fat balls ended about three weeks ago. Um, because food is now kicking in, natural food for birds is kicking in now. Um, if you can afford it and you want to do it all year, there's no harm in doing that. The adults will eat it and they'll concentrate on feeding the young, the caterpillars and things, the soft things that they feed them. Um, but we choose to stop at this time of year, but we go right through the winter. Make sure you clean your bird table and your feeders regularly. Um, there's a lot of problem with disease and stuff. People leave it in, don't clean them, and then they get mould in there and stuff, and that can affect the animals. So periodically you can take them out. Wash, just soapy water is fine. You don't need any, don't want to put any cleaning agents in there. Light soapy water. Um, and just clean them off or brush the bird table off and make sure you remove any bird poo. Obviously, birds are no different from us. Stuff gets passed on, diseases get passed on in all the ways that they do for people. And poo is one of them. So just sort of clean them up occasionally when they're dry. It's a lot easier when it's dried. Um, and provide water, as I said, for bathing and drinking. Important for birds. Um, they wash in it as well, as well as dust baths. Um, shelters. Yeah, build an insect home. Grand one at the top there, smaller ones underneath. Uh, and the bottom one, if you look closely, you just see there's a lizard <laughs> hiding in amongst the uh, bee home uh, there. So, uh, yeah, so make a home. Build it in the sunlight. Um, have the exposed areas facing south or west so they get sun so insects can warm up. Same with reptiles, really. They rely on heat to warm up. Bricks, pallets, all sorts of rubbish and junk in there. Um, and if you get the chance, perhaps put a tray on top. Uh, it can be a wooden one, line it and put a grass roof on top and put herbs in there, flowering plants. They've got somewhere immediately to go to eat. You can use sand and all sorts. So basically, we built ours and we just use all the junk and rubbish left over from other projects. Old roofing tiles, felt and stuff. Um, and there you go. You can make a little planter on top. Deadwood habitats. Uh, I'm passionate about deadwood and deadwood insects because Ashton Common, one of the things it was known for is it had two and a half thousand ancient oak pollards over 600 years old, a lot of deadwood invertebrates and people tend to tidy up stuff. Um, so important habitat and food for things. And this is a stag beetle and stag beetle larvae spend about five to seven years in deadwood eating um, before they pupate and emerge as adults. So it's really important habitat. Um, and obviously beetles and things and larvae are eaten. Woodpeckers, that's what woodpeckers eat. They drill holes into trees and eat the beetle larvae. So they provide cool and shelter for slow worms, frogs and toads and newts and things um, in the summer and uh, sheltered places that are free, frost free in the winter. Um, you can pile them at the back of your 
flower boards out of the way, partly sink them in the ground, have some upright ones as well, all good habitat, and you'll get fungi growing on them. The fungi that grow on the wood will not affect your other plants. They're, they're decomposers. They, they're, they're breaking down and feeding on dead tissue. They're not um, organisms that will attack all your healthy plants. Uh, wildflower meadows and cornfields is the whole subject matter here. Uh, we cover it in the wildlife gardening course and I run courses specifically on it. Um, and basically um, the, the reason most people have problems is lack of ground preparation and the killer for wildflower meadows and cornfields is grass, <laughs> particularly um, uh, uh, domestic grasses that are very rigorous um, and dominate. So uh, wildflower meadows and cornfields, why the two? Uh, what I'd call a wildflower meadow are perennial plants. Uh, they like poorer soils um, and wild grasses they can cope with, but domestic grasses they get um, dis, uh, pushed out by grasses. So where the wildflower meadows, the areas that we've created in our garden, we've always stripped the turf off first and then put seed on bare soil, the, the subsoil. Um, don't you'll, you'll often read somewhere that says wildflowers like poor soils. They don't. It's that grasses don't like poor soils. Grasses thrive on nutrient rich areas uh, and therefore grasses don't do well, which allows the wildflowers to do well. So it's not that they like poor soils, it's just that they're, they're not outcompeted by grasses. Uh, cornfields are what I would refer to, the annual wildflowers. So perennials are obviously plants that come up, they produce flowers, they seed, they sexually reproduce like that, uh, they release the seeds and then they go back and they remain they're either as a rhizome or a root base or a little rosette and they come back every year. Annuals obviously produce seeds and, and then they die off and then you have a new population of new plants the next year. They will thrive in good soils, they'll thrive in, in, in nutrient rich soils um, and arable crops, but they like the ground to be disturbed, they like the soil to be disturbed every year. So if you create an annual wildflower cornfield type effect in your garden, you do need to let them set seed, let the seeds drop, cut them, then rake over the ground and disturb the ground and stop the grass getting in. So, so to finish up, just one thing to do goes back to something I said right at the beginning um, about the well-being and the advantage of gardening and being outside and contact with nature and the value of being in contact with nature. Um, and this is a project that I am involved in, our CIC is involved, our community interest company involved, and the Wildlife Trust is involved with a whole load of other organisations. In that Surrey Heartlands uh, got funding as one of seven areas in the UK for a test and learn project uh, to look at social prescribing. Uh, the, the idea that rather than filling us full of pills, uh, medicines when we're ill, that sometimes um, a walk outside, uh, going into a wood, sitting and listening to the birds and looking at bluebells or gardening is actually really good for our general well-being and can actually help fix the problem that we've been to the doctor about because usually there's an underlying thing that has led to that and the, the problem that we go with is the symptom and not the cause. So this is a project that the Wildlife Trust and we are involved in, along with others, as I say, and it's about looking at prescribing, social prescribing. Um, and it's about awareness and connection, getting people aware that green spaces and outside and gardens are good for you and getting them to connect it. And where they haven't got gardens and access to outside, finding ways that they can connect with that and the idea of community gardens. And I showed you a community garden in Red Hill earlier, and there's a one near us, a patchwork garden in Dorking, um, which is a similar concept about people connecting with plants and animals and outside and other people. Self-referral, self-care opportunities, um, how people can do this themselves. And that's really where our business comes in, our community interest company, because we have people come to us as clients asking either for themselves or for their employees to come um, or you know, with councils, it's about engaging and then getting people in the community to come out and do activities outdoors, whether that's a learning opportunity or gardening. Um, targeted and supported opportunities up against groups that perhaps don't go outside or can't get outside, people with disability, people with uh, social exclusion, people with um, different cultural beliefs about the outside and how you tackle those. A training, an opportunity to teach people new skills, and particularly now in pandemic with so many people who've lost their jobs, um, looking at new ways um, and, and the need for people to be outdoors as an opportunity here for people to train uh, in gardening. Um, community engagement. So Amy Clark, who's uh, one of the managers from So Wildlife Trust, chairs this committee on community engagement. I used to work for her in the community engagement team. 
um, and sustainability, passion of mine about the recycling, but not just that, about um, uh, all aspects, so the social, economic and environmental benefits uh, uh, of gardening people and then there's an evaluation process so this is a project um, anyone can get involved if you google this uh, there is a site they're actually asking people to flag up things that they know about in their communities places they go community gardens community orchards things that are going on that benefit this so they can create a map of the county where all these things are going on so if you get a chance have a look at this um, i'll speak to uh, sophie at the end because i can provide this talk to her as a pdf file so she can send it to you so you can um, garner this information. I also have an article that uh, I wrote for a magazine about the benefits of gardening, which I'll send to her as well, and she can send that to you. So that is me. Done. Thank you so much, Paul. That was absolutely oh, amazing. Whistle stop to <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, yeah definitely send the presentation through that would be absolutely amazing we have a few um, people ask if it's been recorded um yeah. and uh for those of you who didn't uh arrived uh, later on um we are recording this and we will put this up on our online talks page and it'll be available on youtube as well um so there were a few um late um late arrivals uh, apologies for keeping you waiting in the waiting room I was so engrossed in Paul's talk, um, it didn't give me a notification that uh, there was people waiting. So I apologise for keeping you waiting. Um, so um, we've had a couple of questions in. Um, yeah. And um, just before we sort of start, um, for those that um, weren't here at the beginning, um, please do feel free to ask your questions in person. Just be aware that when you're speaking, the recording will pick up on your voice, so you will be uh, featured on YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, feel free to use the Q and uh, the the chat function to ask your question, and I'll read it out on your behalf. Um, so, with that, I will move on to the first question. Um, uh, lovely lady said, I introduced a pond about three years ago, and while we have a few newts in it, I have been unable to attract frogs and toads, despite them being in other ponds in my road. I'm not a particularly tidy gardener, um, have a compost heap, garden organically, um, so there are places to hide and feed. Any ideas where I may be going wrong? No, she's not going wrong. Tell her she's going right because she's got newts. And the reason that the frogs and toads are probably avoiding that pond is because she's got newts, because newts eat uh, frog uh, and toad spawn and larvae. Um, so that's not an unusual situation. Wow. So um, they in the amphibian world, um, the newts are top of the food chain. So they're a predator. Um, it's a natural process. People get really strung out about this and get really stressed about it. <laughs> but it is life. That's the way it is. So the, the point she should do is celebrate the fact she's got newts. She may well have frogs. Uh, we thought we didn't have frogs and toads for year uh, for the because we built a pond about three years ago and we've got newts and they came in right at the beginning. But we've actually subsequently found some tadpoles um, that have survived and we found small frogs and we found small toads. So they may actually be there. You just can't see them. But you're not doing anything wrong. You're doing it right because you've got nukes. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's a very helpful um, answer. Um, does anyone have any um, questions that they would like to um, ask Paul in person? Uh, do feel free to so turn your camera on and wave frantically at the screen and I'll try and spot you um, or um, uh, raise your virtual hand if you're accustomed to Zoom. Oh, we have two people. Uh, right. I, I think I saw the hand go up quickly for Marianne. So Marianne, I'm going to come to you first, if that's all right. Just going to ask to unmute you. She's still muted. Right. OK. Brilliant. Hi. Hello. Hello. Sorry, sorry I came late. Um, we built um, a bee hotel last year yeah. and um, did all the necessary um, little plugs in. Um, I'm just wondering um, how long we might have to wait for them to come out. Um, they usually emerge the following year. 
so if they haven't emerged the following year, it might be that they were either predated or they haven't um, survived, but they don't stay in there usually more than a year. Right. Um, and then I normally get asked about what point should I change, change them over. Um, the thing I say, it's really difficult because what will happen is some will get occupied the first year, some will get used the next year. So it's really hard to tell. And what I will say to people is, you perhaps need to um, consider putting up a second one <laughs> and then replace the first one after a few years because it's hard to judge. And right. um, what you might find as well is you may not have seen it is we found on ours is that the moment you get bees nesting in there, you get parasitic wasps come and lay their eggs in the larvae. So, um, but again, as an, because uh, I'm an entomologist, I find that fascinating too. So, and it's all part of the food chain. So the wasps come and they, they lay their eggs on the larvae. So the larvae of the bees don't emerge, but the wasps do at some point. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's been just over a year. So. Yeah. Um, at some point, um, I, I, I've got three up now. At some point, I need to take the first one down <laughs> right. and refresh it. Um, if you're going to do that, the best time to do that is in the summer, because obviously they emerge in spring. So they'll come out during the spring and they emerge as adults and go. So if uh, and it's timing it right, because obviously you've got to watch because they'll come and lay the new eggs. So you've got a, is a, is a little bit of a window between right. early spring when they emerge and when you, that you start seeing them in the garden. You need to catch them before they really lay a whole load of new eggs. And then you can take it down, put it in the shed. Um, and if you put it in the shed and there are some still in there, they'll still come out. They'll come out of the thing, but you won't get new ones going in. And okay. then you can restock it if you want to. Okay. Does that All make right. sense? Yes, it does. Thank you Good. so much. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for your question. That was an I excellent question. I think Peter question. had his hand up as he well. Did. He? he did. He did. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Over to you, Peter. You need to unmute, Peter. Yeah, there you uh, No, he's still muted. Peter, you're still muted. I can't hear you. There you there. Is that working now? Yes. Perfect. Brilliant. I can hear you now. Okay. Um, a great talk. And I'm sure most of us are going to disappear into the garden when you finish and start creating something <laughs> or digging a hole or making a pond. Um, uh, just two quick things. Um, I want to create an area of longer grass. So, yes. Um, uh, do I, and, and I'm, on, I'm on, on, on the downs in Merrow near Guildford, it's very thin yeah. soil. Do I just leave an area unmown and let the grasses grow up or should I actually be trying to plant some chalk grasses um rake off the soil and start again or just leave the grass to grow both but what I suggest you do is what we did here and it's come you remember what I said in the slideshow about assess so leave your guard leave it and, yeah. and don't cut it and let it grow long for the first year and see what comes up because you might be surprised. We were really surprised. I mean, I bear in mind my background and bear in mind what I do. I was surprised about what came up when we started no mow mm -hmm. may because we used to mow a bit and the plants are there, particularly the perennials, because you mm. keep cutting them, you don't see them, you just see the rosette. Yeah. So leave it a year and, and look and see what comes up. And if you've got stuff already in there coming up, then fine, that's great. If all that happens is you've just got a domestic grass and it's just long and there's nothing else growing in there, that's the point at which then um, you want to think about doing something else. And what I'd recommend you do is you do patches and blocks or strips if you're going to seed them. Uh, okay. If you're doing plugs, you can plant into them. Um, just bear in mind that natural process, part of the natural process is a thing called succession. So if you don't mm. cut things at all at any time, then um, they will progress through to a coarse grass and then a, a rough vegetation and ultimately they go to woodland. So you do have to cut long grass areas, but you do it in, in patches and blocks and you do it late in the season. So I even my no. long grass areas, I every I don't cut them every year, some of them, but I cut them maybe every other year, every third year and I scythe them and I rake them off and then I let them go through the cycle. But but leave it a year. Just leave it a year. Don't do anything. Just yeah. Don't cut. Have a look see what comes up and then you can make a judgment about whether you actually need to put anything. You may be surprised. You might have more yeah. in there than you realize. Hope so. That's brilliant. Really good answer. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, did That's you have a second fascinating. one? Fascinating. Uh, well, I, I did. Am I allowed a second question? <laughs> go on, go for it. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, I'm a church warden at our local church and we're trying yep. to make the whole churchyard really eco-friendly. And yep. so I've, ch I've changed the mowing regime and we're leaving areas to go wild. Yep. 
but I've got a great south facing bank that I, I, I've actually bought a chalk and limestone wildflower. Yep, um, same supplier we use. So <laughs> should I actually be just roughing up the ground or should I actually strip no. off the turf? I want to plant this on a little area. Yeah. Now, as I said at the beginning, grass is a killer. Um, so you've either got to, we did both here. So where we were sowing yellow rattle, I don't know if you've heard of this, but yellow rattle is a plant. They call it the meadow maker. It's a plant that's parasitic on grass right. um, and it attaches to the grass roots. So it needs grass. So if you're planting yellow rattle and you're using that, you need to cut and cut and cut the grass really short, damage it effectively, rake it and scarify it and really break up the ground so that there's some bare ground, but don't remove all the grass. And right. then you can sow your yellow rattle mix on that and it will attach to the grass and then once it's established it'll set seed every year you have to cut it at the end of the year and then it will reduce the grass bigger and other plants can grow if you're doing a, a general mix that doesn't have yellow rattle in then you really need to remove the grass first so you're best to cut off the turf so you only need to cut off the bit that covers the the roots and remove that rake over and scarify the subsoil don't bother putting any thing else yeah, and sow the seed directly on that some grass will come back but it will allow the flowers to establish first okay that makes sense? Uh, am, am i a bit late in the season to be doing this or? uh check the <clears> pack <throat> but you might still be where are we now we're, we're april you might still have a window they do sometimes say up until may land life are really good that's where i get my seeds from they oh, if you go online they've land. got that's it yeah. yeah that's where i get my seeds from if you go yeah. online they've got information sheets so if you go back on the website you can Brilliant. actually um, go to the seed pack and at the bottom there's a box that says more information got that. Yeah. On, on the website and they've got information sheets. They're two sides of A4 and they'll tell you the time periods and stuff. Brilliant. Really good information sheets. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very right. much. Okay. Sorry, sorry about, about my two questions. <laughs> really interesting questions um, thank you yeah i'm learning so much so thank you um we had a, a comment through from our lovely pam um who has been working really hard uh pam's been a supporter and a trust uh trustee and a volunteer for many hello many pam <laughs> Um, she has been working and helping our comms team with the uh, wildlife gardening uh, campaign and survey um, so just uh, nudged me to say uh, to promote it um, and what I will do is I if you haven't come across it I will uh, try and email everyone who is registered uh, for this event because I appreciate some people came on late if you haven't registered uh, do feel free to email me directly, sophie.code, C-O-A-D, it's about like toad really with a C in the beginning, um, at surreywt.org. Uh, is there a UK at the end? I always forget. Um, yes. But do feel free to email me and um, I can email you the uh, survey link. But that's a really, really fantastic foundation for us assessing your garden. As Paul said uh, at the very start of his presentation, assess your garden, find out what you've got. Um, and this campaign will continue to grow and there'll be tips. And uh, Pam, if there's anything you would like to add, do sort of raise your hand. <laughs> um, and, and she's raised her hand, brilliant. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you to unmute. There you go, my love. Oh, we can't hear you, Pam. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. So just in the meantime, while um, we sort out technical problems, does anyone else have a question? Sally, shall I come to you? Right, there we go. Oh, we can't hear you either. What's going on at the moment? Maybe it's us, Paul. Can you hear me? I can hear yep. you. Can you hear Peter? Yeah, I can't hear. Sally or Pam. Right, bear with us a second. They We're might. Just... It depends see... whether they've switched their audio thing on on when they then they logged in. They do have to do that. Yeah. So Pam's they need to, not, got it's thumbs not just up. muting. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Right, I'm just going to see if we. Can... Oh, there we go. Yeah, I've switched microphones. Is that better? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Good morning, you. Sally. How are you? Good morning. Very well, thank you. Um, I'm even better now because I've heard that Peter, who lives opposite me, is um, going to be 
growing lots of long grass to attract insects into it. Because I have, I live opposite Peter and we are on the edge of, you know, the downs and we have AstroTurf, I'm ashamed to say. We've inherited it like fake <laughs> milk. <laughs> so I'm not saying anything. No, I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that Peter will offset <laughs> mitigate some of this but um i've been toying with getting rid of it and um we're kind of northwest facing we've got trees over over you know overshadowing so it does serve a purpose to some extent is well, there a well one thing i'd say to you sally is i i i and I, i've got a friend who's just moved to the coast and he, he sent me some pictures of his garden that were full of um slate and he was going there's no lawn there's no lawn i'm not a real advocate of lawns we've okay. been so We've been sold a myth by the Americans and the gardening world about lawns and how we should have these big green expenses and we should cover them with fertilizers and treat all the weeds in them and mow them. So why would we buy a spend money buying a machine mm. and stuff? So the best thing you can actually do is by installing some raised beds mm -hmm. and growing wildflower mix. And the wildflower mix, we've just done it in our garden actually. So all the time we put wildflowers in our garden. So I, you saw my garden from the mm. thing. We don't fight the grass, so we use old tires. So we cut the rims off old tires and we fill them full of soil. We make raised beds out of waste timber and we sow into them. And then the flowers don't have to compete with grass. And then you end up with a lovely uh, uh, bed with a, a high nectar source flowers that the insects will go in and they'll feed. Um, so the, the long grass habitat's great for voles and mice and slow worms and toads and things. Um, and certain grass species of insect, things like skipper butterflies and grasshoppers. But that doesn't mean you, you can't have insects in your garden. So, um, and then you don't have to fight the grass all the time. We weed in our garden, but we're constantly weeding grass. And people mm. find that bizarre when I tell them, but that's what we're weeding. We're weeding out grass because for us, grass is the killer. Grass is the thing that displaces the flowers. So, um, so yeah, go for it. Build yourself a raised bed. Okay, I, I Get some old tires. Brilliant. Depends where you live. Not everyone likes seeing old tires. We, they've got used to us around here. So. <laughs> They're used to us hiking back. And ro I, ro I rolled back an old lorry tire the other day. I found dumped at the side of the road. And so we've turned that into a raised bed. But uh, um, you have to have understanding neighbours sometimes. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Brilliant. Thank you for your question, Sally. Um, I can see Robert has his hand raised. So, Robert, can I come to you? I'm not going to touch anything. So, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> you can. Yes. Good morning, Robert. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Brilliant. Ah, Technology is working this end, then. That's yeah. good. Um, very, very quick question. Paul, great presentation. Thanks so much. It's really helpful. But, very specifically on ponds, we yes. had a new pond built in, in November. So yep. it's very new. Um, the, recent, <clears throat> the recent very dry weather means that the level of the pond has gone down very low. Yeah. Um, the guy who built the pond said, don't fill it up from the tap, which of course makes complete sense. But without any rainwater to fill it up, is it okay just to leave it? Um, yeah, I, I know why he said don't fill it up from the tap. Um, and, I, and I do understand. And we, we top up our pond. We filled our pond originally. Uh, local volunteers came around to do their pump flood pump training and they pumped water out of the ditch into our pond so we filled it that way and generally <laughs> we fill it with water from the numerous water butts we've got around but i do have yeah. to top it up sometimes with tap water um and it's not okay. ideal because it's high in nutrients i i don't think we always realize what we're drinking <laughs> and actually the, the tap water we drink is stuffed full of <clears throat> nitrates and sulfates and stuff so it encourages algae but pragmatically you have to um, but you can um, allow ponds to, to partially dry up and then they fill up again in the winter. And seasonal ponds like that do have value for wildlife. It really depends what you've got in it. Um, because we've got breeding newts and we've got breeding dragonflies, if we let it dry up completely, they won't survive. Uh, the level does go down, so I don't keep it as high as in the winter, but I do periodically t top it up because I have to. Okay. Um, particularly the it's particularly yeah, in the spring useful. you'll find probably the way the weather's going in the summer we start to get a bit more rainfall so um and the irony is is the more plants you put in the more that they use the water them we forget pond plants use water and they transpire and they evaporates from them so they they help reduce the water level too yeah yeah but yeah it's just a it depends on what's in there and it's a pragmatic um 
yeah. choice. But I do understand why he said that to you because uh, when we're building ponds, we try and encourage people to fill them with rainwater and use rainwater yeah. because of the nutrient levels. That's really useful, Paul. Thanks right. very much. Thank you. That's a brilliant question, uh, Robert. Thank you so much for asking Well, one that. other thing, Sophie, while I remember, um, you talked about different things. We should promote the um, Surrey Wildlife Gardening site on Facebook. So I don't know who listening actually uses Facebook, but Surrey Wildlife Gardening site is a site hosted by Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, it's a really active, um, dynamic site. I, I post on it a lot. So um, there's a lot of information goes on and people share ideas and information. And it's a, it's a lovely community. It's a really positive community. So if you're not already, uh, if you do Facebook and you're not already on it, um, I suggest you join it because it, it's it's um it's a full of fun, like minded people, really. Um, and if nothing indeed. else, you get to get ideas from other people's gardens and you get to enjoy some really interesting wildlife spots. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I don't know if it was that group that yesterday I saw the post about um, sinking an old children's sand pit. That's my in... post. Yes, I thought that it was. was my... <laughs> and, you know, that's yeah. brilliant because it's exactly what I've been planning to do yeah. as well. So, um, I think I see. Um, is there anyone else with a question? I thought I saw someone's hand go up very briefly. But... No, no, no one taking uh, the the sort of question uh, time. That's brilliant. Um, uh, Pam's just um, said, um, yeah, do sign up to the sort of wildlife gardening campaign. Um, so it's really simple, natural examples for everyone, no matter what size of garden you have. Um, and this is such a common question. I remember when we did Guildford Goes Wild um, a couple of years ago now, people uh, a lot of people think, oh, I can't do it. I haven't got a big garden. And in a, a six by sort of four foot space or whatever it was, um, we created this tiny little garden on the middle of a high street. And within hours, yeah. wildlife was coming. It was astonishing, the impact, just by putting some raised uh, flower beds, a bucket pond, um and a sort of fruit tree and just simple little things like that can make such an impact and it's so incredible just to watch literally within hours yeah. you can make a difference and we shouldn't forget allotments either um allotments really just be cautious with allotments that if you want to put ponds and things in you should speak to the allotment uh, owners so whether that's a parish council or district council or uh, whoever, um, because they might have rules applying to that allotment which prohibit it, but generally they, you can do. And a lot of people um, have started putting little bucket ponds on their allotments to attract insects in um, and wildlife. Um, and you can grow uh, thing. Think about mixed planting. I didn't really say it, but one of the principles of organic gardening is a mixed planting approach. So you plant flowers, nectar bearing flowers in amongst your vegetables because then they attract things like hoverflies, um, and other insects in there and those and those some of those insects will then predate on the larvae that are feeding on your vegetables so um, if you can really really grit your teeth and step back um, and do follow the no dig you can allow ground cover plants things like um, uh, sank foil and um, creeping jenny and various other plants that provide ground cover and you can let them grow amongst your vegetables and they'll provide cover for ground beetles so one i mentioned uh, in our garden toads and slow worms but we have a good ground beetle population and most ground beetles are predators so along with spiders so they'll eat um, the insects that are feeding on your vegetables um, i know some people find it hard we've been we've been led a culture that you 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 you're a good vegetable plot is dug over and it's clear of all sorts of weeds but actually the evidence shows um that uh, vegetables um can thrive and if you go back to the old cottage garden principle people who had cottage gardens their gardens had to be useful they weren't just for flowers um and i live in an estate that was fundamentally um owned by workers who worked on the nearby uh, countryside estate and they all grew vegetables in their gardens and they grew flowers in amongst the vegetables and some of those flowers were for enjoyment some were for cut some were for medicinal purposes but it was mixed planting um and we've gone down a monoculture approach in this, not just this country, I mean, other Western countries as well, but mixed planting is good for crops, 
but it's also good for wildlife and having the right wildlife there will then predate on the things that are in your vegetables. So just something to bear in mind. There's loads of information about that online if you look it up. No dig and stuff. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, so we've mentioned we've mentioned the course. It's actually full. I hadn't realised it's full, but um, I'm running a course, sorry, Wildlife Trust about um, wildlife guarding and ponds. Um, I said to Sophie earlier, if there's enough people want to do a course and if you nag the adult education team, they might put on another one. <laughs> um, so, yes, so there's a course I've mentioned about the Facebook page. We've talked about that. You've talked about the wildlife gardening project. Oh, the only other thing to bear in mind as well, there's a national project going on in June um, about community growing. I'm frantically looking about because I can't see the poster. It's one of the first weekends in June. Um, let me see if I can find it. And there's loads of information nationally knocking around that. That's a partnership between various organisations as well and we uh, we're going to run an open garden here uh, it's on the 5th saturday 5th of june so some communities are not running open gardens like the rhs one at the moment the moment but we are going to run an open garden here for limited numbers of people um, linked to that national scheme so again that's about promoting wildlife gardening in gardens and in allotments and community areas so i don't i think i've covered everything sophie brilliant Thank you so much. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, this is the start of our wildlife ga uh, gardening campaign. Um, so there's lots of stuff that we've got planned coming up. Um, on the 5th of May, we have uh, Claire Gibbs, um, one of our brilliant ecologists at Surrey Wildlife Trust, uh, talking about um, the wildlife that can be found in your garden. So once you've um, built and um, created your wildlife garden. Let's learn a little bit more about what incredible uh, species we can actually encourage into our garden. Um, so she'll be doing an evening talk there. Uh, there will be a dawn chorus coffee morning as well. Um, so if you're not a fan of getting up at four o'clock in the morning and listening to birdsong, um, Katie Fielding, our incredibly knowledgeable um, a colleague is doing a coffee morning showing the highlights of this year's um, sort of dawn chorus and helping sort of identify bird sound, um, which you could do from your gardens as well. Um, so get out there and listen and record. When's that, Sophie? Um, that is, oh, my phone has just gone. That is on the 13th of May. Um, and we've got another evening talk um, from two of my wonderful colleagues, Kirsty and Louise Shorthose. Um, who are um, greening their streets. This has been their lockdown project. So they've been encouraging their neighbourhood. And similar to um, Paul and I were chatting um, earlier about, and he mentioned about WhatsApp groups um, within your sort of village, uh, your community. Um, they've done this as well. And they've this WhatsApp group has grown into this kind of, well, let's sort of um, free cycle things. Let's... Um, uh, put little signs out and not mow our sort of grass verges and stuff like that and the whole neighborhood have come together so if you've ever thought of um, getting together with your neighbors and creating networks for nature um, this is a brilliant talk to attend um, because they, they've been through it they've seen the good the bad and the ugly um, so um, you can learn from their successes and some failures um, We've got to try in life. <laughs> Where, where's that? When's that? That is on the 19th of May and yeah. that is online as well. So you go to the online talks page, um, you can book places for that. Um, I won't take up too much more time, but just to summarise, um, there's an evening talk on hedgeho hedgehogs from the incredible Hugh Warwick, who is um, quite a few of our staff worship his knowledge. Um, and there's another coffee morning from Katie. I'm on connecting nature through hedgerows. Um, and uh, Zoe Channon, um, uh, another of our colleagues, will be doing a coffee morning on planting for pollinators and no more May, uh, no mo May. She has been documenting in a blog, uh, blog or she will be um, over the course of May, to document exactly what has happened. So what flowers have grown? Um, how she's sort of found the sort of not mowing and what insects have come and 
uh, stuff like that. So that'll be really interesting. Um, and we have another coffee morning on wildflowers and orchids and an evening talk um, on earthworm uh, ecology. Um, and the last one of the series, which I haven't yet put online, will be a talk about beetles. As Paul mentioned earlier, um, beetles are extremely important um, and often overlooked in our gardens. So um, please go uh, online and um, book your place. Um, they'll all be free um, to celebrate wildlife gardening. Obviously, if you'd like to make a donation, that would be wonderful, um, but they're free. And our main aim is just to encourage people to get out there and um, garden for wildlife. Um, uh, one of my colleagues has signed on um, as well to attend this talk um, and sent me a message from me, which is quite interesting, um, saying that if anyone is interested um, on our uh, homepage, there is a uh, we have a link up to one of the bird box cameras at Noah Wood and uh, this beautiful blue tit um, is uh, currently incubating. Um, so if you'd like to sort of keep an eye on them and watch them hatch, um, do go to our homepage and follow it live. Um, that's it from me, unless anyone has any questions or comments or anything. When we go offline, I will send you the PDF of the presentation and I'll send you the article so you can send it on to people if they want it. Brilliant. All Thank right. you so much, Paul. I've, uh, to be honest, I don't want to do any work this afternoon. Um, I want to be out in the garden now. <laughs> That's so... where I'm going next. <laughs> Thanks Sorry. for that. That's my so... workplace though. It is my workplace. <laughs> so I will put the remainder of the events online uh, so everyone can book and um, I will put our recording from today online. So if you missed anything, you can watch it later. Um, thank you all so much for joining yeah. us. It's so lovely to see all your faces. Um, and I look forward to seeing you. Uh, Keep up the good work, events. people. Get out there in those gardens. You can yes. do it. Go outside and garden <laughs> for me and I'm stuck behind yeah. a computer, please. <laughs> Bye, right. everybody. Lovely to see you. Cheers. Thank bye -bye. you.